tonight on Wings. Take off with the Discovery Channel in the F-14 Tomcat. Today, the F-14 is the aircraft carrier's first line of defense. Celebrated in the movie Top Gun, Tomcats first proved their worth over the Gulf of Sidra in 1981, where Libyan Su-22s proved no match for the swift and agile Tomcats. Tonight, soar high with the F-14 Tomcat on wings. On the 25th of February, 1979, the Russian warship Minsk slipped through the Turkish Straits and into the Mediterranean. Classed as a cruiser to comply with Turkish regulations, the Minsk was nonetheless an aircraft carrier. But its comparatively small size and total commitment to vertical takeoff warplanes gave Western analysts a chance to study Soviet thinking on naval aviation. Clearly, Soviet strategists did not believe they had a need for large carriers able to support a wide variety of aircraft. American thinking, on the other hand, has gone towards the development of massive carriers, often nuclear-powered. These, the largest of man's mobile creations, are able to convey and support several different types of aircraft. Carriers provide the U.S. with the option of sending its potent air power to areas where it does not control airstrips, as was the case in various stages of the Second World War the Korean conflict, Vietnam, and more recently, the Persian Gulf. American attack carrier can only be perceived as the ultimate gunboat. But if an aircraft carrier is to provide the weapons, it is also an inviting target. With up to 5,000 lives and an almost irreplaceable amount of technology, aircraft carriers are vulnerable to aerial attack. To counter this threat, the United States Navy relies almost entirely on one remarkable aircraft, the Grumman F-14 Tomcat. America's involvement with carrier forces is greater than any other nation. It was aircraft from the Japanese Carrier Task Force that devastated Pearl Harbor guaranteeing U.S. participation in World War II.
It was only from the deck of the carrier Hornet that Jimmy Doolittle was able to lead the B-25 retaliation attack on Japan. Although the attack caused little damage, it broke the myth very early in the conflict that the Japanese homeland was beyond Allied reach. The Battle of the Coral Sea again proved the potency of the carrier-launched aerial attack. But it was Midway that was to prove the greatest carrier-against-carrier -carrier conflict. It was the American victory there that would set the trend for the remainder of the war. Midway was to show the strength of carriers. It also demonstrated they were vulnerable from the very type of aircraft they carried. Since that time, it has always been the threat of aerial attack that has been uppermost in the minds of carrier commanders. the mid-1950s, the principal threat to American carrier forces still came from the air. Russia had developed long-range maritime reconnaissance bombers, such as the Tu-20 Bear. Powered by massive turboprop engines driving counter-rotating propellers, the Bear was not fast compared to fighters of the time, but could carry supersonic anti-ship missiles, which could be launched with devastating effect. Against this combination of long-range and advanced missile technology, the U.S. Navy had to completely rethink the role of its fighter aircraft. To counter the Soviet threat, the Navy had to develop a very special aircraft, not a fighter in the tradition of previous conflicts, rather a long-range all-weather interceptor. To fill the role, McDonnell Douglas developed the F-4 Phantom II. The F-4 Phantom II was a massive plane for its time. It provided the speed, altitude and range that would keep missile carrying aircraft at a safe distance. Its most important feature, and a break from previous convention, was the use of two crew members, a pilot and a radio intercept officer. The RIO provided the pilot with valuable...